I just don't think anyone would ever choose to have an eating disorder or choose to have ARFID. And I think that a lot of times the behaviors that we will view as being pathological or really a logical choice for the individual based on their neurobiology. And if we can kind of figure out what's going on under the hood, we might be able to be more creative about the treatments that we developed to try to help people. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. The skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. Welcome to the Seasoned RD Podcast. I could not wait for this episode to drop, and it is with Dr. Jenny Thomas, who's a researcher at Harvard and so much fun. So I used to have this opinion. I guess this is going to sound bad for those of you who are researchers, but I've been socialized to think that researchers, folks who are into statistics, might have kind of a more subdued, quiet personality. But let's just say that Jenny Thomas has a huge personality, and that comes out in our discussion today about ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. She talks through the phenotypes of ARFID. I didn't get into the ARFID Plus, which I think was the part I was trying to get to with the DSM-5, that not being in there. But anyway, some folks who start out with an ARFID diagnosis and merge into some body image concerns, but that's another podcast for another day. ARFID impacts young, old, lower weight, higher weight, all genders, and the protocols are emerging, but there's still a lot there for us to start with. This is a full call out to you as the professional to have your clients with ARFID and with adults uh, contribute to this NIH study so we can continue to learn. Shout out to one of my adult clients. You know who you are. Dr. Thomas describes your evolution to recovery so well. Information is in the show notes on the study. There's so much information on the show notes, different resources, books, workbooks, articles that you will want to check it out over and over again. Finally, please do consider joining me for Supervision Freebies, a listener comment from Maria I am a registered dietitian. I absolutely love your supervision freebies. I work as a performance dietitian and I'm new to the field of eating disorders and your podcast and freebies are so helpful. Thank you, Maria. And all the information for that is in the show notes as well. Welcome, Dr. Jenny Thomas, to this podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Beth and Janice and Abby. We can't wait to chat with you. I think ARFID is such an interesting topic that we don't discuss enough in this community, the eating disorder community. So we're excited to get into the topic, but I'll ease you in with some icebreakers. My first one for you, mountains or beach? Oh, beach. I grew up in California, Southern California, so definitely the beach. (laughs) Hard to beat the beach. I'm a a beach girl as well. Breakfast or dinner? dinner. Yeah. One thing I do, I have young kids who are ages three and six. And so we have these theme dinner nights that are each around a children's book. So like on, on dragons love tacos night, we like make tacos and I read them the book and on Stregonona night, we make pasta and I read them the Stregonona book. So that's really fun. I do love having dinner with my kiddos. That's so fun. I love that. Okay. The last one is audio book or paper book audiobook because I'm a working mom <laughs> y'all and I definitely need to multitask so love the audiobooks for while I'm jogging or doing dishes or tidying around the house <laughs> totally and that's why I love podcasts because we can do them um, passively but then we can rewind that's the other thing because sometimes I fall asleep when I'm watching or re- reading a book so thank you for that I love the whole meal theme idea. That is so fun. All right. Well, I am going to take you back. You are PhD 
Yeah, in clinical psychology, yeah. In Mm -hmm. clinical psychology. And so I'm going to take you back to hopefully not traumatize you too much about a board exam because we have newer clinicians. We have people still in their schooling. We have others who have been in the field for many, many, many years who are listening. And so we just want to bring that human piece back to it. Do you remember, what do you remember from a board exam? Well, I remember that to become a licensed clinical psychologist, you have to take this exam called the EPPP. I can't even remember what it stands for at this point, but it's this big daunting exam. And the way that I studied for it is one of my friends and I would get together every Wednesday night and we would order like Thai food and we would just study together. And if there were topics that we weren't familiar with, we would like look up YouTube videos to watch about it. And so even though the exam itself was stressful, I just remember trying to make it fun by, you know, making it social with my friend. I love that. Like literally when I, Jan, I'm looking at Janice right now because she's 40 years in practice and I'm over 30 and we didn't have YouTube videos. Like I used to tell oh. people, my clients, you're wa- walking encyclopedia when it comes to knowing about food and, and that. And now I have to say you're walking Google page or Google search. <laughs> Things have changed so much. So that is really, really fun to get together with your friends and, and Thai food helped you pass the exam, I'm sure. Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. Well, how did you get into the field of psychology and into ARFID and eating disorders? That's a great question. So when I was growing up, I was a pre-professional ballet dancer. So I would dance for many hours a week. And, you know, back in those days, I think there was a little bit less awareness around eating disorders and kind of body positivity. And so for sure, a lot of our coaches would kind of make comments about our bodies and be telling us to lose weight in order to get parts and be successful. And so certainly eating disorders were, you know, a big piece of of growing up in, in the ballet community. So I wanted to to kind of give back and to try to help people. So I decided to pursue my PhD in clinical psychology and focus on eating disorder research. But once I started going into practice, even though the disorders I had learned about were things like anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder, even a lot of the patients that would come to see me didn't quite fit neatly into those boxes or those categories. And in particular, I started to note that there were some patients coming in that would restrict their eating quite a bit, but they didn't really have those body image concerns that you know, had been so pervasive in, in ballet that had been sort of the reason that I got into the field. But I became quite fascinated by that. You know, what would sort of drive somebody to restrict their eating by volume or variety if it wasn't anything to do with body image? And right around 2013, the DSM-5, you know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, kind of the Bible of psychiatry, identified ARFID or Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder as the diagnosis. And I thought, all right, that's it. These patients, they have ARFID. And I wanted to know a little bit more about why people might develop it and how we could help them. Could we use the same strategies that we've been using for other patients or do they need something different? You are such a teacher. I was going to ask you to explain ARFID. You did that and the DSM-5 because some people are, they may not know what that means. So thank you so much. I didn't know you were a pre-professional ballet dancer. And that really makes a difference. I'm thinking of probably a handful of clients right now that I've worked with with ARFID. And they're all along. It's not always the gaming teenager who just doesn't want to get up and eat. And and the, there, there's often subtypes that are promoted. It's not in the DSM five. But anyways, tell us what you want us to know about ARFID. Sure. Well, it's a really heterogeneous disorder. I think sometimes as clinicians, when when we're learning, and really just this is how our brain learns as we come up with a a schematic or paradigmatic examples or prototypes of things. And so we'll think of maybe a, a prototypical person with an eating disorder that might involve some stereotypes about somebody being young and thin and white. And we, we all know hopefully that that's not correct, but particularly with ARFID, it really spans the spectrum of, of the whole weight spectrum. We see individuals who are young, like very young people. We see older adults. We see folks 
folks who are very underweight. We see folks who have, you know, quote, normal weight or a higher weight body. We see individuals who are, who are male or female or identify as transgender or non-binary. So really it's a disorder that can affect a lot of people. And clinically, there are really three phenotypes that we tend to see, like when you were saying, Beth, about the subtypes. So DSM-5 mentions very briefly that there are three possibilities. One is that there are folks who have like a sensory sensitivity presentation. And so typically these would be folks who have difficulty eating enough variety of food. So they might eat like mac and cheese and vanilla ice cream and chicken nuggets and bread or butter pasta noodles, but kind of a lot of carbs and dairy and maybe not very many fruits or vegetables. It's really hard for them to bring on board new foods because they think things might taste weird or have a weird texture. It's tricky for them. Then there's another phenotype where people have had like a traumatic experience happen to them, but specifically around food. So not trauma like we might think of with post-traumatic stress disorder, but more trauma around like choking or vomiting or having some kind of a really bad virus that puts somebody with a lot of pain in in their belly or their GI tract or maybe an allergic reaction. And then the person starts to really limit their diet in order to prevent that bad thing from happening again. And then the third phenotype that we tend to see is folks who just say that they don't get hungry or that when they do get hungry, they get full very quickly on small amounts of food. And we call that like the lack of interest in eating or food phenotype. And I would say that one is kind of the the closest or the has the most blurry distinction with folks who might see with anorexia nervosa. There are some shared features there, but the main difference is that those folks really, they talk about not getting hungry and feeling full again, rather than having weight and shape concerns. And one thing I would just say about the phenotypes is that they can occur separately. So I'll see patients who just have one or they can co-occur within the same individual. So for example, one of the first patients that I saw was this 11-year-old little girl who had a very long history of very selective eating and had been fairly lowish weight for her entire life. But she got some orthodontic hardware put into her mouth and was eating and a piece of pork got caught. in in the metal that was now in her mouth and she choked and that was really scary for her. And so in order to, to try to prevent that from happening again, she started to really limit her food intake. So she started to not eat obviously pork that was off the table, but then stopped eating meat, stopped eating anything that might be kind of stringy in texture. And then finally, by the time she came in to see me, she was really only drinking liquids like Pedialyte and water and milk, which as you can imagine, could be really problematic for her mental and physical health. So that would be an example of somebody who has all three phenotypes at the same time. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about the importance of a care team. And usually it's, I'm assuming there's going to be some crossovers with your dream care team for a patient who has ARFID and crossovers with a patient who maybe has binge eating disorder, let's just say, but I can understand that maybe there are some members of the care team for ARFID that aren't necessarily also in the care team for binge eating disorder. So who is your dream care team for a patient with ARFID? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that at minimum, somebody with ARFID would need to have somebody looking after their their medical status, you know, so a, a medical doctor or a nurse practitioner, so someone looking after physical health, and then somebody who's going to be looking after their their mental health or their behavioral health. And that might be a psychologist or it might be a social worker. It could also be a dietitian. So I think just backing up historically, before ARFID was recognized, there was a category that actually still is a category of pediatric feeding disorders. So these would be like young kids who have difficulty eating. Often they might be underweight. They might have physical difficulties that make it hard for them to eat because of a medical problem. Maybe they're on a feeding tube. And historically, those kiddos would have a very comprehensive treatment team that would include not only just a a dietitian or a psychologist, maybe they'd also have a gastroenterologist, also an occupational therapist or speech therapist, all kinds of different colleagues to help them out. And I think that all of those potential disciplines are potentially relevant, but that not every patient needs every single one. So it might depend a bit on the person's presentation. 
I think the food therapy or the occupational therapy side of ARFID is so interesting. And I swear those practitioners work some magic. Like, I don't know how they do it, but it is so, so interesting to me. Are you ever working with an ARFID patient or a patient with ARFID in person, like on that kind of setting? Or what's that like for you? Sure. Well, so I'm a clinical psychologist, so I have obviously different training than somebody that's a speech therapist or an occupational therapist, and they do a lot of really cool work. I mean, I would say that my colleagues who are occupational therapists working with ARFID would often do things like helping the patient to chain to new foods or to kind of practice trying new foods, which is interestingly has a lot of overlap with the exposure type of therapy that a psychologist might do. So the approach might differ slightly, but there's a lot of overlap there. And with older patients, occupational therapists might help patients with things like cooking, like how do you actually prepare like grilled chicken or how would you use a fork and knife to cut meat if you've never eaten it before? And then there are speech therapists who often can help folks who have a difficult time with chewing or with swallowing. It's interesting, though, because sometimes, for example, speech therapists might be very necessary if there's a patient who from a very young age has only eaten purees and they never learned how to chew properly. And so they're going to need some help from somebody like a speech therapist to be able to graduate to more textured table foods. On the other hand, if it's an older patient who is kind of going along developmentally just fine, they've been chewing meat and and textured foods for quite some time, and they have a choking incident where they say, oh, now I've forgotten how to swallow – It isn't necessarily that they've forgotten how to swallow or chew. They may not necessarily need training from a speech therapist on how to do that because their body had done it before, but they might be more avoiding food because of the anxiety and they're needing more like an exposure therapy treatment from a psychologist. So I guess I would say again that there are so many different disciplines that have different expertise and kind of can look at ARFID from all different angles. And it depends on the individual case, what might be necessary. Because even when you say like the dream team, I'm thinking, you know, in Boston, where I am, it's like an embarrassment of riches. You know, there's so many hospitals, it's this medical town. People can get so many different professionals to help them out. But then there are many, you know, people who live in all kinds of other places where they don't necessarily have access, you know, so maybe they're only going to have a dietitian to help them. And I think that they could do really well if that dietitian is using a lot of the a lot of the strategies that we know are helpful for people. You know, maybe they don't need a speech therapist, for example. So I have a question. Is is ARFID kind of the failure to thrive in older folks? So when I say that, when I worked in a children's hospital, we had a team for the failure to thrive clinic and there would be a psychologist, there would be medical provider, there would be the the nutritionist or the dietitian and speech therapy would be in that initial consultation. And, and so I'm wondering, cause all three phenotypes I've had clients within and but they've been older. And so I think at the at the hospital that I worked at, it was kind of like, well, I think that this needs to be, they're, they're older than six years old. And that was the failure to thrive age range. I don't know if, if that makes any sense, what I'm even asking. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, actually, because even though we in the eating stores field kind of talk about ARFID being this new diagnosis because it was added to DSM-5 in 2013. So from that perspective, the name is new and having it as a category within the feeding and eating stores category is new. That being said, prior to that, there was a diagnosis that was in a different section of DSM-5 in childhood disorders called feeding disorder of infancy and early childhood, of which people who currently are diagnosed with ARFID could have been previously diagnosed with that feeding disorder of childhood, right? So it, so this new ARFID diagnosis is an expansion of that old diagnosis to include individuals who would have been diagnosed with that, but also people who are older than six years old and also people who are not at a low weight. So kind of mimicking the way that the eating disorder diagnostic nomenclature has grown and matured. You know, it started out with just anorexia nervosa, and then we realized that, hey, not everybody with an eating disorder is underweight. In fact, that's probably the minority of people with eating disorders. So adding bulimia nervosa, adding binge eating disorder, adding other specified feeding or eating disorder. And so that feeding disorder of infancy and early childhood has been now expanded. 
and I think interestingly as well is the question of sort of who owns this diagnosis now, you know, so it's become part of psychiatry in a way it's within the DSM five, but there are many colleagues who have been working with folks who have what, you know, might be called failure to thrive. I think that term is a little pejorative as a mom. I, you know, I feel bad for parents who are told that their child is failure to thrive. I wish it might be named something different, but, you know, we'll go with that term or pediatric feeding disorder or the feeding disorder of infancy and early childhood. So I think it is important that as, as eating disorder clinicians that we're respecting all of the knowledge that our colleagues have in this space of the pediatric feeding disorders, but then also thinking about what might be similar or different when those young people do grow up into older children, adolescents, and adults. What can we learn from those earlier treatments and what kind of things may not work because they're more child-oriented or more oriented towards a young person who also has a co-occurring medical difficulty that's making it difficult for them to eat. So I think it's really interesting whether adult are fed is these young kiddos with quote failure to thrive just growing up, whether it's something else entirely or whether there's some overlap and some differentiation. Yeah. And you're doing some research to help us define that better. I mean, the whole, what, tell us about your new NIMH study. Yeah. Thanks for asking, Beth. So I've been lucky to work with a multidisciplinary team of colleagues at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So on our team, we have psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, endocrinologists, statisticians. And what we're trying to figure out is what might be the neurobiology of this illness of ARFIT. So, you know, way back when I started to sit with my first patients and they would say things to me like, well, I forget to eat, or it just doesn't occur to me to eat. I just thought that was so fascinating because I don't know, like my time right now as we're recording this, it's about maybe like 1130. And I'm already wondering, like, I wonder what I might have for lunch later, or, you know, maybe what we'll have for dessert tonight. It's it's on my mind thinking about what I might eat. It's something I'm looking forward to, but many of these patients, they're really not looking forward to it at all. So I thought that was quite interesting. What might be going on? And there are biologically that would create that phenotype. And so what we do is we have folks come into our lab after they've been fasting overnight and we give them a test meal that's kind of standardized for about 400 calories and standardized with the various macronutrient intake. One thing just as like a sidebar is that it's really interesting to do this work because we have based it on the paradigms that we've used with anorexia nervosa, where a lot of times those participants are kind of okay with eating the standard meal that we might provide. But many patients with ARFID will say, okay, well, I will come in and eat the toast, but it has to be this one type of toast and it can't be whole wheat. It's got to be white, has to be toasted, but only to this degree. So we have worked with our awesome research dietitians to figure out how can we create a meal that will be edible by this person with ARFID, but have similar calories and macronutrient content to what we're serving in standard. But anyway, the the whole point is that we'll um, hook people up to an IV and look at their appetite regulating hormones, both before they consume the meal and then for up to two hours afterwards. And then we also will show them images and pictures of food, all different types of food and objects while they're in an fMRI scanner to look at how they might view those things or have a different reaction than healthy control individuals who don't have ARFID. So a couple of things that we found that are really interesting is that there's a hormone cholecystokinin or CCK, which is associated with the feeling of satiety. And what we found is that individuals with ARFID, when they come into the lab in a fasted state, have super high levels of CCK in comparison to healthy individuals. So even though they have not eaten anything all night, you know, we make sure to clarify that with them. Um, they come in and like they're CCK is really high. So their body is telling them maybe they're already full, like it's not really time to eat right now. So it kind of makes sense then that they would tell us that they're not hungry or that it doesn't, the food isn't appealing to them. So I guess it all comes back to, I just don't think anyone would ever choose to have an eating disorder or choose to have ARFID. And I think that a lot of times the behaviors that we will view as being pathological or really a logical choice for the individual based on their neurobiology. And if we can kind of figure out what's going on under the hood, we might be able to be more creative about the treatments that we developed to try to help people. And so is that one of the treatments, like learning how to normalize their CCK levels or how do you, what do you do in that scenario? 
That's a really good question. So in the future, it might be interesting to see if there could be a medication that would be like a CCK antagonist to kind of like reduce their CCK levels. So that could be something that we can consider down the road. But at least in the short run, one of the things that I'm interested in also is whether some of the behavioral strategies that we use with patients actually might help to normalize their underlying neurobiology. So one thing that we haven't published yet, but we have some new analyses that we've just finished that I can share with you is that we do see that the CCK levels go down after successful treatment of ARFID. So once we have encouraged folks to do probably many of the things that you're already asking your patients to do, like eating normally throughout the day regularly, three meals a day, not going a long time between meals, having snacks, diversifying their diet, and if they're underweight to try to gain to a healthier level level, that then it does look like their CCK levels normalize, which is really exciting. So maybe we won't even need a pill. Maybe some of those things actually can get better as somebody is eating better. I have a question. This is so fascinating. I can't even tell you how how much I admire your work, but in someone who is weight suppressed, malnourished, I work with geriatrics a lot, but I can think of other incidents. If they are very weight suppressed, the brain is starved. Is does it heighten the the symptoms of of ARFID? And if they're weight restored, nutritionally rehabilitated, do you see a improvement in that? Yeah, that's a great question, and I would say clinically for sure. So one of the things you know that's really interesting when we offer the cognitive behavioral therapy for ARFID or, or CBT AR is that we'll work with if it's a young person, we work with their parents and and the patient. If it's an adult, like a, maybe an older adult, we work with just that adult and if they're a partner, maybe that person as well. But it is we would help them to try to eat more, more regularly, more volume of food if they were underweight, so they could gain weight. And what we often find is that even before we do some of our interventions around helping them tolerate fullness or get used to the body sensations, they already will start to tell us that they're getting hungrier or they're feeling more used to eating food simply from the act of of eating food. And going back to the appetite relating hormone piece, we haven't looked at this specifically in ARFID, but I know from other literature that you can develop a cadence of appetite regulating hormones. Like, so I pretty much will always eat lunch at about 12 o'clock. That's just mm-hmm. how it works out with my day. So typically when that happens, like your ghrelin levels, that's like a, a hunger hormone would start to rise right prior to that. But if you were someone who typically had a later lunch, like let's say you like lived in Latin America and you're going for your siesta at two or 3 p.m then your ghrelin levels would not start to rise until later. So one of the things we try to help patients to, to understand is that if they are eating at regular times, their body will come to expect that, partly because of this cadence of the appetite regulating hormones. And I imagine that might be one of the ways that just sort of doing that simple act of getting them to eat on a schedule, like you guys are probably already doing with your patients, is actually helping them to correct the aberrant neurobiology that is maintaining the symptoms in the first place. And and dealing with, if you're eating at regular times, which is our goal, and their body will come to expect that for so many with eating disorders, to, that the fear of like, I don't want to be eating at regular, I don't want my body to expect that, I want hunger to be suppressed forever. So that's a hard, that's a hard one that we always work with a therapist on too, you know. Well, one thing I think is so interesting, sorry to interrupt, is that the difference between patients with anorexia nervosa and with ARFID around that. So, of course, I think what you're describing is, you know, patients being really afraid of, of being hungry. And many of my patients with anorexia nervosa would present it in exactly that way. They would be really terrified of getting more hungry and eating more. And on the other hand, many of my patients with ARFID are actually really excited about the possibility of getting their appetite back. And sometimes when they're, you know, they're restoring their weight or or actually frankly gaining weight for the first time, because maybe they've been very low weight for a long time, they're like high-fiving me and really excited about it. Like I had a little boy patient who was very excited to tell me that he had grown taller and that he was starting to grow a mustache and he was pretty (laughs) into that. So that was just really sweet and fun. Um, And with ARFID, you could work with so many more boys as well. I know obviously in other eating stores, there are boys and men too, but they, I think less often do they come to clinical attention attention, maybe because of stigma as well. So in ARFID, it's been fun to just work with a whole variety of of different individuals and try to help them with this illness. Thank you for pointing out that distinction because we can't just lump all eating disorders into 
that. So that's an, an important one. With the study that's coming out now, who are you looking for? Yeah, thanks for asking. So the neurobiology findings I was telling you about earlier, I should mention, were we were looking at adolescents and young adults. So it was like ages 10 to 23 that we are recruiting. And we're done with that study. And at this point now, we're looking at neurobiology in adults with ARFID. So we're okay. looking for... You know, if any of you have patients that have ARFID and are interested in taking part in research, we'd be really interested in having them come to Boston and, and take part. It's a, a five-year study. We're looking to get about 150 individuals with ARFID who are ages 18 to 45 and who are able to tolerate some time in an fMRI scanner. Mm. And when you say come to Boston, that's how long would they be there? <sighs> So for probably for a couple of days in order to do a screening visit and then a baseline visit. Okay. And you're looking for a good number of them. And I have a, I have a handful in my head right now who I'm going to have them actually listen to this episode because, for example, with the Angie and the Edgy studies that Dr. Bulick is doing, yeah, that they don't get any information back. I don't know if you're study shares with them any any of their findings yeah we can let people know about their self-report findings in terms of the brain imaging and the hormone findings we usually can't let people know uh, on an individual level what their findings are because we run those things in batch later on yeah. um, all together so that we don't all have de-identified to too. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I think it, you know, it can be helpful just for people to have that experience of being evaluated. I think, you know, one of my most fun experiences as a clinical researcher is some colleagues and I, through an international collaboration, created this interview for ARFID called the ARF, called the PICA ARFID and Rumination Disorder Interview or PARTY. And the party has a lot of specific questions about ARFID eating, like things about your variety of food, or are you afraid of eating, or what gets in the way of trying new things, and so on. And one of the first participants in our research study that I gave this interview to at the end, she said, did you make up those questions? And I was like, Yes, I did make up the questions, you know, with my colleagues. She said, well, thank you for, for creating this. And thanks for not asking me if I think I'm fat because I know I'm not fat. I don't have anorexia. I think this interview really gets at ARFID. And that was just such an awesome, you know, uh, an awesome experience to feel like you, we were really getting into the symptoms that were relevant to people who have this illness. And I love the, the party. <laughs> Yeah, it ended up to lots of fun puns. <laughs> like if we would have a meeting for data analysis, we'd say, oh, it's a party party. <laughs> <laughs> Is that available to the general clinician? The yeah, actually, it's really available and we're happy to share it with anyone. It's really meant to be used, I would say, in clinical or research settings, but it is we use it more so in research because it's fairly long. It takes about 40 minutes to give the yeah. whole thing. That being said, though, we just published a self-report version that's much faster and easier to score. And so that I can definitely give you guys links to that. That would be awesome. Yeah. For the show notes, for sure. So we will also put links if anyone listening has a patient, a client that would be interested in doing this study. What are the time frames that you're accepting patients? For the next few years, actually, it's it's from 2022 to 2027. So we'll be interested for quite a while. Awesome. Because we are going to be doing some reposts. This podcast is kind of closing out. We have a really good following. And some people are asking if we can put it on simmer instead of just shutting it off. So we're going to come back in a different way in the fall, but there's going to be some reposts. So knowing that this is through 2027, anyone listening can click on the show notes, the link in the show notes and get their client over so that we can get this information out. Mm. I have a, I have a scenario question for you, if you don't mind. So whenever I think of ARFIT, I instantly think of Ellen Satter and Division of Responsibilities, but it still feels tricky to 
so let me just, I'll just get into the scenario, I think is a better way to do this. So you have a new patient, they are a child and parents are just the pro the, what they think is going on is, okay, my kid is just really picky and we make them finish their food before they leave. And they're not allowed to have any other food if they don't eat their meal. And if they aren't finished, they have to sit at the table while, you know, everybody else is trying to do the things to get their kids to grow. And I can understand that, but it feels a little bit uncomfortable for me to then say, okay, well, you you maybe shouldn't do that. Like, why don't we take this approach? But it just feels a little uncomfortable, I guess. So what do you, I guess, what would you suggest in that scenario? Sure. I would say that in developing the cognitive behavioral therapy for ARFID, my colleagues and I have stood on the shoulders of giants in terms of thinking, you know, our thinking coming after the thoughts of many great colleagues who have thought about these things for a long time. So for example, with Ellen Satter's work in the division of responsibility for feeding, you know, she talks about how like the, the carer or the parents will decide like, what they're going to feed the child and and when, and then the child themselves decide how much they're going to eat. And I think that works out beautifully for the vast majority of children who are like normally developing and don't have an eating disorder. But I think once you get to the point where somebody has ARFID and, and very severe ARFID, because I want to clarify too that, you know, this isn't just people who like are sort of picky and like they don't like broccoli or something. It's like, oh, we'll work with kids who eat no vegetables at all or whose BMI is less than the first percentile because they're not eating enough or they're getting most of their calories from Boost or Ensure. Or maybe they're living in a higher weight body, but they'll only eat two or three foods total. So it's really hard for them to get all the micronutrients that they need. So I think in that case, it is important for the parents to step in. I probably wouldn't recommend maybe something so extreme as as some of the rules that we've all learned about maybe having to sit at the table for three hours. I mean, actually, I remember even just personally one time when I was a child, my parents wanted me to eat those these like stewed tomatoes. And I got in this kind of battle of, you know, sitting there, I wasn't going to do it. And they wanted to feed it to me for breakfast. Anyway, I think, you know, they were just trying to be helpful. They were doing the best we can, like we all are. But anyway, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but I would probably recommend trying to make sure that there are enough preferred foods for the child at each mealtime so that they have some calories, like something to eat. Like we usually will start that regular eating pattern on preferred foods and then slowly introducing the novel foods in a way where it's a little, it's giving them a little bit more choice in, in the matter. So usually I would say in our treatment, if it's a young person with a family, the parents really drive the the volume. Like I would encourage them probably if it's a young person who's underweight and not eating enough food to be supervising the meals and sitting with the child, kind of like you might do in family-based therapy for anorexia or bulimia, but, but not in a way that they're being angry or forcing or stern, but just saying like, all right, well, you know, here's your mac and cheese. I know this is something you like. Let's make sure you get enough for dinner. And then when you're wanting to do the broccoli, we would bring that in a little bit later once the regular eating pattern is established and we have certain strategies for how we might introduce that. So the first thing is that we would let the child choose which vegetables that they want to do, right? So we wouldn't say, well, I think you need to do broccoli or, you know, just like when I was a kid, I wouldn't have wanted someone to say, you ought to eat these tomatoes. I would say, we would say, well, here's this list of all these different fruits and vegetables, which ones would you like to learn about or to choose? And so in that way, we, again, standing on the shoulders of giants here, you know, we borrow some ideas from Kay Toomey and her SOS approach. And, and we'll have folks, the the young people choose which fruits or vegetables that they want to learn about. And then we do that, do exposures where they kind of start out by feeling and smelling and looking and touching and tasting. And then finally practice tasting before they're eating incorporation portions. And hopefully by the end of treatment, then they're eating the broccoli with the mac and cheese. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes it's, I mean, it's maybe a little startling for parents when they bring their child in and they think that they're just a picky kid and there's nothing else to it. And then you present this idea of ARFID and it's the like a big acronym and we've never heard of it before. And where does this come from? And so it does seem like maybe there's a little bit of like, what are you talking about? Like you want my kid to just play with their food. Like it's, it feels like there's like levels to kind of guiding the parents through, but it's a lot to ask of them to take the time to do this with their kid. 
Sure. Yeah, I think it, it is a lot of time. And that's partly why the treatment that we've developed, the cognitive behavioral therapy for ARFID or CBTAR is a time limited treatment. So we try to have it go no more than 20, kind of maximum 30 sessions, because it is a really like long road for parents to be supervising the meals and like, you know, running to the store to get all these foods that the kids are going to taste and to do the exposures and go to the sessions. And so we try not to make it go on too long. And one thing I want to go back to about kind of the, the playfulness with the food, I would say in our approach, it's a little less about playing with the food because sometimes, you know, kids could maybe like play with yogurt for a long time, but if they never actually taste the yogurt, they're not going to know that it's something that they could eat and then translate that into eating. So we do try to pretty quickly get into them actually eating it or trying it. And if it's something they're really unwilling to try, then we just don't push that particular food. It'll be like, all right, well, maybe yogurt is not something that you want to learn about for now. Let's add something new on board. And we also try to just encourage folks that learning about new foods as a lifelong process. So like some of my favorite things that I like now, like coffee or pod thai or things that I didn't even start eating until college. I think it's helpful to hear that too, that, well, it's okay. If, if you don't want to have this, that's fine. We'll move on to the next thing. Because I think sometimes, especially for dietitians, it's like a checklist, like, okay, well, we have to get the breakfast, we or we have to get the yogurt done. Okay, now we're going to move on to the broccoli and we have to get the broccoli done. So it's nice to understand that it doesn't have to be perfect. You can kind of move around and go from there. This is just such a new, I mean, dietitians don't learn about eating disorders in general, but I feel like ARFID in particular is such a, it's a different topic. Do you, I'm curious if you have any, helpful resources you would recommend to dietitians just getting into the world of ARFIN? Sure. So let's see, I, I would be remiss as the current president of the Academy for Eating Disorders to not, you know, recommend that folks consider joining our organization and looking at all the backlog of webinars that we have, many of which are on this topic of ARFID. We have many psychologists, dietitians, physicians, psychiatrists who are part of the Academy. And so we welcome that. There's also another organization that focuses more on, on young people with pediatric feeding disorders, but it's called Feeding Matters. And that also has a lot of really cool content about ARFID, especially as it presents in young people. And then my own team has written a couple of books about ARFID, um, which I hope could be a good resource as well. So we've written a book that is for a manual for clinicians called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, Children, Adolescents, and Adults. So it's kind of a manual that goes through our treatment. And I will say that when we first delivered the treatment, it was psychologists offering it. But even right now, I have a student who's a dietetic student who's running a trial in Australia to look at a dietitian led version of CBTAR, because I really think that we need like all of our colleagues together trying to help folks. And we don't have to be really specific necessarily about which discipline it is. Not everyone's going to have access to any particular type of discipline at any point in time. So I would welcome, you know, dietitians to check that out. And then the other book that our team wrote, it's really for patients, but dietitians might consider looking at it to see if it'd be appropriate to recommend to their patients is called the Picky Eaters Recovery Book. And that reviews the CBT strategies for individuals with ARFID based on our cognitive behavioral approach. That's like gold, Abby. See, you ask the greatest questions because I was going to, I, I wanted some guidance to where people could go and you just did that. Yeah, those are really, really helpful. And I, I think patients really love, like the last one you mentioned, kind of like a book that they can work through. So that'll be, we'll have to include all these in the show notes. But I do have a wrap up question for you, Dr. Thomas. So if you were to take yourself back to entering the field of eating disorders, what do you wish you would have known then that you do know now? I wish I would have known how much fun it is to integrate research and practice. I think I originally thought that I might just go into investigation and be a researcher, but as I started seeing patients, you know, just like I told the story of how I got into ARFID, I really just get my best ideas from, from patients and people with lived experience with these illnesses. That's how I figure out what kind of things I might want to test or what might be going on with the neurobiology. So yeah, I wish I would have known how complementary those two things can be. 
Right. I mean, the the questionnaire you came up with that just displays it perfectly is that to come up with those questions, you had to really understand what was happening with the patient. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today on the Seasoned RD. Yeah. Thank you so much, Beth and Abby and Janice for having me. It was a really fun chat. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethherald.com slash professionals.